Hey, what's up guys? It's Matt with The Movement System. Today we're going to be talking about the different types of muscle fibers. We're going to specifically talk about type 1 versus type 2X muscle fibers, the differences in the structure, the differences in the function, and then differences in the physiology and how that impacts training. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Alright, so to start off, let's go ahead and lay the foundation with what we're talking about with muscles. So, we have one big muscle. So if you think about your whole bicep, for example, that contains a lot of muscle fibers, but there's also groups of fibers. So if you look at this picture here, you can see there's groups called fascicles, and that's just a group of a bunch of muscle fibers. So if we go even into that fascicle, we can see individual fibers, and then at the very smallest level, you'll see myofibrils. So when we think about muscles, we have to think about the fact that those fascicles are basically each having one nerve that goes to them. And when we consider one nerve and all of the muscle fibers within a bundle that it innervates, we call that a motor unit. So, importantly, when we think about this next picture, this is a really good way to see the difference between the type 1s, the type 2As, and the type 2Xs. So what you'll see here is the green muscle fibers, those are groups, and, and obviously within a real muscle there's going to be many more than just, you know, four... <laughs> Uh, motor units of type 1 fibers, but this is just to simplify and kind of give you guys a good visual for how this looks like. Throughout that muscle, there's going to be different motor units, type 1, type 2A, and type 2X. So you can see here the green ones, those are our type 1 motor units. So one nerve goes to all of those fibers that are within that green section, and all of those fibers share similar characteristics in that they're type 1. And we're going to talk about exactly what characteristics those have versus the yellow type 2As versus the blue type 2Xs here in a second. But we have to think about that overall muscle has some combination of green type 1s, which are not actually green, that's just kind of for the description here, but some combination type 1s, type 2As, and type 2Xs in what we call a mosaic distribution. So there's some distribution of all these different fiber types. And importantly, when we're activating our muscle, we always recruit our type 1s first. So this is called the size principle. I actually have a whole video on this if you want to check it out in the description below. But basically, when we're going to lift weights or to lift and move our body in any way really, when we activate, we always activate our type 1 muscle fibers first. If we activate that first green one, the second, the third, and the fourth green one, and we run out, and that's not enough force still, then we'll go to our type 2A fibers and we'll start to recruit those. So we'll recruit those type 2A fibers and if we need to, we'll go all the way up to our type 2Xs and we'll start to recruit those. So importantly, our body makes this decision because our type 1 fibers are very oxidative and they're fatigue resistant. So we want to recruit those first. If, if we don't need that much force, we're just going to use those type 1 fibers because again, that will keep us from, from hitting fatigue and uh, keep us from running out of energy so that we can keep our type 2s for if we really need them. So that's kind of laying the foundation here for the physiology. We always want to recruit our type 1s and then our type 2As and then our type 2Xs. So let's get a little bit more specific into the properties of each of these muscle fiber types. So to start off, our type 1 muscle fibers are our slow twitch fibers. And they're specifically categorized as our slow twitch fibers because they have a slow twitch in the sense that the nerve conduction velocity that they have is slow and the time that it takes to actually create a muscle twitch is slow. So if we think about like a graph and our, our muscle twitch, it's kind of this slow and steady graph rather than our type 2s we'll see are a, a, a higher peak. So these muscle fibers are characteristic by being small, red, and recruited first. So these are our smallest fibers, so if we think about the amount of fibers within that motor unit, it might have fewer total fibers than our type 2As, which are going to be bigger motor units. And then high fatigue resistance. So this means that they have a low amount of fatigue, they fatigue very slowly, which makes them highly fatigue resistant. Again, they're oxidative. These are really good for endurance activities, low force activities that require high oxidative enzyme content, high oxidative capacity to perform that activity. This is going to be a fiber that's very high in myosin ATPase. And this has to do with the amount of basically contractile force and the, the rate of force production of that muscle fiber. 
Uh, this also makes this muscle fiber have low power. So this is a muscle fiber that doesn't have a ton of power capacity. Again, if we have to do high force, high power activities, we're gonna use our type twos. Uh, a couple more properties of our type ones. They're high capillary density, meaning that there's gonna be a lot of that blood flow to these muscles, a lot of oxygen delivery to these muscles, and high mitochondrial density within this muscle fiber type. Uh, mitochondria is our oxygen, our oxidative capacity to deliver oxygen to that muscle, and uh, basically the myosin that makes up the, the cross bridges within that type one muscle fiber requires a lot of oxygen to be able to contract slowly, but many times. So the, again, that's gonna be a, our most oxidative fiber. And when we think about sports specificity, this is gonna be a really important fiber for cross country runners, marathon runners, triathletes, anyone who's an endurance athlete. All right, so next we're gonna move on to our type 2A muscle fibers. And just a quick caveat, some people will classify these differently. The most common classification is type 1, type 2A, and type 2X. In reality, it kind of works on a big spectrum, and we could kind of define them. Some people say 2Bs, but in general, most people, most of the research classifies it as type 1, type 2A, and type 2X, so that's what we're going to use for this video. So, our type 2As are our mixed fibers. These are our mixed oxidative glycolytic fibers, in the sense that they have some oxidative capacities to them, in, in a sense that they're not very high fatiguing, they have some better fatigue resistance than our type 2Xs, but not quite as good as our type 1s. They're also mixed in, in their force capabilities and force production, so they can produce more force than our type 1s, but not necessarily as much as our type 2Xs. So again, they're in the middle of that. Uh, these are generally larger motor units, so one nerve, again, to many muscle fibers. Uh, so say, just for a simple example, our type 1 motor units might have averaged 100 fibers in a certain muscle. Our type 2As might have 200 muscle fibers within their motor units. So again, bigger motor units for this type 2A. We're gonna have faster contraction and relaxation speeds and higher nerve conduction velocity. So this is gonna get us that intermediate power range. So again, instead of our slow twitch and our fatigue resistance, we're, we're kind of producing force slowly and dissipating force slowly, that was our type one. In this case, that, that force is gonna be a little bit higher, it's gonna be a little steeper, so we're gonna produce force more quickly, but then also fatigue a little bit more quickly. In this case, we're gonna have a high anaerobic enzyme content. So this is what we mean when we say glycolytic fibers. So when we think back to bioenergetics, and again, watch my whole bioenergetics video if you wanna review on that, but when we think about the energy production, how we get ATP, our type one fibers are oxidative. They're gonna get a lot of their ATP from aerobic processes. Our type 2A fibers are what we call glycolytic. So the enzyme content of that muscle fiber is more in line with the anaerobic processes. So that means that our anaerobic glycolysis can actually give us more ATP that contributes to muscle force generation and the cross bridge cycle within our type 2A and type 2X fibers. And then lastly, this one's gonna have low myoglobin. So again, myoglobin's what actually gets oxygen from the blood and delivers it to the muscle. And we know that our type one muscle fibers are highly oxidative and highly efficient with oxidative processes. Our type two A's are gonna be less oxidative and less efficient because of that lower myoglobin. All right, and let's move on to our type two X fibers. These are the biggest muscle fibers. So if we think back to that size principle of recruiting our type ones, that's gonna be with higher rep activities, like running where you're doing hundreds of revolutions per minute or reps per minute, you know, cycling, stuff like that. That's gonna be our type ones. Our type two A's are gonna be that intermediary. It might be weightlifting, but more in that like eight to 10 rep range, for example. Our type two X's are gonna be our high force, high power activities. So these are things like the Olympic lifts, power lifts, you know, sets of two, sets of three, and even potentially jumping. But we have to think about that we have to do jumping activities that are potentially loaded. So something like a loaded jump squat might be long enough ground contact time to actually get all the way to recruiting our type two X's. So when we think about our type two X's, these are gonna be our largest motor units. These are gonna have very low fatigue resistance. So that means they're gonna fatigue very quickly. So if we activate our type two X's, we can't activate them very long. It's gonna be a high, 
force, a high spike of, of activity and high force, but it's gonna also drop off very quickly and require longer to rest and recover. These are gonna be our white fibers. They're our largest fiber diameter. These are gonna be our highest recruitment threshold, meaning that we need to recruit all of our type ones, all of our type two A's, and then we can actually recruit our type two X's. These are gonna have the highest force and power production and the lowest capillary and mitochondrial density. So these are our worst in terms of oxidative and our best in terms of glycolytic and power production. Uh, these are going to be used for sprinting and weightlifting and high force activities, especially when we think about powerlifting and weightlifting, uh, one rep maxes. Those are going to be kind of really characteristic of our type 2X fibers. All right, guys, if this video has been helpful for you so far, go ahead and hit the like button. Let's go ahead and get into our muscular adaptations now. So this is the exciting stuff. How are we actually going to adapt our muscle fibers based on training? Most people would actually kind of think that if we do high force activities, increase our type 2 X's, and if we do low force activities, increase our type 1's. That's actually not necessarily the case. The most common muscle fiber type transition is actually going from type 2 X fibers to type 2 A fibers. So both aerobic training and resistance training result in the adaptation of more type 2A fibers. Why is that? Well, type 2A fibers are that intermediary fiber. They're more fatigue resistant than our type 2X fibers, so they're more of an athletic type fiber. They can do sport movements really well because they can do high force production, but also not fatigue too quickly. Uh, if we do have a lot of type 1 type training, so we're, we're doing oxidative and, and running training, aerobic training, we will have significantly more type one muscle fiber hypertrophy and type one muscle fiber enzyme growth and whatnot. But in general, our biggest transition actually is from type two X to type two A. Another thing we need to think about is detraining. So if we stop training or if we're starting to get the aging process to take over and perhaps sedentary, what's gonna happen to our muscle fibers in that case? Well, in that case, a process called denervation happens. So we can actually de-innervate the muscle fibers, specifically our type 2X and type 2A muscle fibers. So those high threshold fibers that are only recruited when we're doing high force and high power activities, if we get older or sedentary or detraining, we stop doing that type of training, we stop sending the signals from our brain to those muscle fibers. So we will start to lose the innervation going from our brain to those type 2X and to those type 2A fibers. What will happen there is those fibers will actually start to de-innervate and now there's some muscle fibers that are basically just sitting within your muscle and they have two choices. They can either atrophy or they can actually pick up innervation from a type 1 muscle fiber. And this could actually be problematic because if our type 1 fibers start to innervate more and more bigger motor units, we can start to lose dexterity. The principle there is basically if we can keep recruiting our type 2 fibers into old age and from training, we can start to improve our dexterity and improve our muscle mass through, through the aging process. All right, so let's go ahead and get a little bit into the nitty gritty about how this muscle fiber transitions happen. Uh, when we think back to the actin, the myosin, we remember from the cross bridge cycle that the, the myosin heads attach to the actin and they shorten to cause muscle contraction. That's our sliding filament theory. So those myosin heads attaching to the actin and causing a contraction and shortening can actually have some damage. So we can damage that myosin head in the process of lifting. And this is actually a good thing because we'll grow more myosin heads and, and cause muscle fiber hypertrophy. So this is normal and the shearing of myosin heads can actually cause more muscle protein synthesis and be a good stimulus. Now, if we're constantly shearing off our myosin heads, we can actually create different myosin heads. So what we call this is the isoform of myosin can actually change. So the, the type of myosin head that we have can actually change potentially from a heavy myosin chain to a light myosin chain. What that all basically means is that the, the myosin can change and it can change the property of the muscle to actually act more like a different fiber type. So acting more like a type one or acting more like a type two A or acting more like a type two X because our muscle protein synthesis response changed the way that that actual muscle fiber is rebuilding. So just to be really clear, with weight training, we can see an increase in myosin heavy chains and more of that type two property of our muscle fibers. 
So overall, if we create that muscle protein synthesis response and create those myosin changes, we can see an increased myofibrillar volume or muscle hypertrophy. All right, guys, so I hope that was helpful for you. If it was, go ahead and hit the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, go ahead and subscribe. If you're studying for the CSCS exam and you want to learn more about that, go ahead and click the link in the description below to join the Strength Conditioning Study Group on Facebook. All right, guys, I hope this was helpful for you, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.